Hi, my name is Hilary Stupa. Microsoft has awarded me an InfoPath MVP annually since 2009. I spend a lot of time helping people in the InfoPath Dev Forum, which is also the home of my blog, and occasionally on the Microsoft Answers Forum as well. I'm an InfoPath developer for Qdabra Software. Qdabra provides tools, forms, and solutions to the InfoPath community. I work out of my virtual office in Eastern Oregon. In this video, I'll be talking about OData producers, which can be of enormous benefit when working with InfoPath. First, I'll talk a little bit about what OData is, then go into some details about accessing OData producers, including URI conventions. Then I'll address using OData producers in InfoPath. And finally, I'll do a quick walkthrough so you can get a real-world example of the benefits. OData is a protocol and is shorthand for Open Data Protocol. This protocol enables querying and updating data, provides capabilities for filtering and sorting data, as well as other functions, and returns data as XML, among other formats. This is done using simple HTTP messages, and resources are identified with URIs. The fact that we get our data via URI, and that it is returned in XML format, should make InfoPath developers prick up their ears immediately. But wait until you take a look at this list of producers. SharePoint 2010 produces OData which means that the URI conventions I'll be reviewing can be leveraged for pulling just the data you need out of SharePoint. Other producers are Microsoft SQL Azure, so your data that's in the cloud is easy to get into your form, SQL Server Reporting Services, IBM WebSphere, and major companies like eBay and Netflix. The first part of the URI to an OData producer is the path to the service itself. The first example I've got here is to the OData test service. You can see by the XML snippet on the left that it returns three entities, products, categories, and suppliers. The second example I've got is to a SharePoint 2010 OData service. You can see I've used a placeholder in this URL of server name. You can just replace that with your SharePoint 2010 server's server name and try this link in a web browser. The XML returned will be all of your site lists and libraries. Having created the URI to the service we want, we next need the path to the resource. For example, Categories 1 Products directs us to all the products in the category entity with the key predicate of 1. The key predicate is the key to the entity, or um, if you were talking in terms of a relational database, you'd probably say the primary key. This can be stated using name value pairs for complex keys, which we won't delve into today, but do keep in mind that it's available. Another sample of an entity could be a tasks list from SharePoint. If the data you see in your browser is not detailed enough, viewing source on the page will unveil all the XML being provided. So you can see in two of the screenshots there's a simple blue piece of data, blue underline, pretty date, maybe a little more information. But in the bottom far right, you can see that I viewed the source of the page, and I can see all of the properties that belong to the entity I'm investigating. This is important. You may not know the name of the properties of an entity. In SharePoint, title is an easy property to get right, but who knows offhand that the list column status in a tasks list is really named status value. The XML displayed when you view source can assist you when you work on refining your URI. We can also use InfoPath to help expose properties, and I'll show you more about this in the demo. There are additional URI conventions we can leverage for discovery and specificity. Metadata provides additional information about a given service. We can see all the properties for an entity. We can see the key. We can see the properties that make up the key, if it's a complex key. And we can see the relationships between entities. The OData test producer is a great producer to investigate initially, since it's pretty simple. Links shows us the related information. For example, we can find all the product URIs for category 1 in this example to the lower right. You can see it returns products 1 through 6. And select is a system query option. It allows us to specify which properties we want to return from our query. This can be extremely useful in InfoPath as it allows us to return only the properties we need in a secondary data connection. Finally, there are many other system query options beyond select. A common pain point for InfoPath developers is the order of data. We often want data ordered in a specific manner for a drop-down control or a multi-select list box, generally alphabetized. InfoPath doesn't give us a way to sort data after it has been returned, at least not without writing some code. With the order by option, the data comes into the form already sorted. So the link underneath the first bullet would return all of our products sorted by rating ascending. Filter does exactly what you'd expect. It allows you to filter by property values. You get all the basic logical operators like equal, not equal, less than, greater than, and, or, not. 
The first URL here would return all of the customers from Northwind, where the country is equal to USA and sorted by company name descending. Now the SharePoint 2010 OData service also allows us to use filters, and the second URL would return all tasks, where the status value is equal to not started. There are also some arithmetic operators available, um, add, subtract, divide, etc. And this third link in the second bullet point would return all of the products where the price less 5 is still greater than 10. As exciting as all that is, it actually gets even better. There are functions that can be used with the filter query option. Functions like starts with, ends with, and one called substring of that is basically a contains function. In the first link under the third bullet, you can see that I'm returning all tasks where the title starts with update. Make a note of the syntax. It's the function returning true. So we've got starts with title and then the string we're checking for equals true. Two upper and two lower are also included in the string functions, which is great with XML and case sensitivity. And there's some additional mathematical functions as well. There's even date and type functions. The final URI in this slide shows a return of all orders where the rounded freight figure is equal to 32. So how do we access OData from InfoPath? Obviously, first thing we need is a form. Then to add the data connection to an OData producer, you use a REST web service data connection. The connection needs to return data in order to generate a schema. So even if you intend to change the URI dynamically in your form's rules, you'll want to specify the entity you want with a placeholder key predicate value. You can use SELECT to return just the columns you need when creating your connection to keep your secondary data source less cluttered. Don't let data load automatically unless that's what you really want. And finally, we can use InfoPath data connections to learn about the properties available from an entity. So without further ado, let's take a look at a quick demo and see what you can do with InfoPath and OData. By using an OData provider as a REST web service in InfoPath, we can query for just the data we need in our InfoPath form with no code required. This can speed up our form's load time and general performance, as well as offer only right options to select from in a dropdown. First, let's create a connection to the categories in the sample Northwind data source. Under the Data tab in the ribbon, select from Web Service and from REST Web Service. Enter the URI to the Web Service and select Next, and we'll give it a meaningful name. Now we'll take a look at the schema generated in InfoPath. We have to drill down a bit, but here you can see the Properties group, and in here you can see all of the properties for the Categories Entity. I'm going to create a second data connection, and in this one I'm going to use the Select System Query option to return just specific properties. So again, it's from Web Service, from REST Web Service. You'll notice the URI looks different in this one. I've added the question mark and then the Select Syntax to return just the Category ID and Category Name. Had I not known what properties belong to the Categories Entity, I would have been able to find them over in my data connection that I initially created that returned all of the properties. Give this data connection a meaningful name. So let's look at the schema for this new data connection. We drill down and we can see that we've only returned the category ID and the category name. So far, so good. Next, we're going to create one more web connection, and it's going to be to the products. Notice again I'm using the select syntax and the use of a placeholder here to return just the first category. I'm going to give this a meaningful name. And in this instance, I'm not going to automatically return data on load. We're only going to want to get the products we need after the user has selected a category. Select Finish. And if we take a look over here, again, we drill down and we get to the properties. And we can see we return just the ones specified in our select statement. One of the many great features in InfoPath 2010 are the enhanced layout table designs. You can find them on the Insert tab. I've already added one to my canvas. I'm using a two-column table. You'll see that I've given my fields here meaningful names. There is nothing worse than coming back to work on a form that's field 1, field 243, and so forth. Always take the time to give your fields meaningful names. I'm going to wire up my drop-down controls to use my secondary data connections. So first off, we'll select our drop-down list box properties for our categories. I'm going to get these from an external data source. I'm going to get these from, I'm going to use my category select data connection that I created. 
and the entries are down here. We can just select properties, and say OK, and you'll see it defaults to show category ID for both value and display name, but I know that category ID isn't very friendly, so I'm going to display category name and select OK. That gives me my categories. For my products, I'm going to use that products data source that we created. So we go here, products, and again we drill down until we find the properties. We select it. You can see that we've got defaults here. Let's go ahead and change that to product name and we'll say OK. So now both of our drop downs are set to use secondary data connections. Sure, you can hard code stuff in your form drop downs. I wouldn't recommend that though. It's always nicer to have your data source outside of your form. If you've ever had to maintain a drop down that has its values in the form, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And so now let's take care of the magic part of all of this. And that's where we change the URI for our products based on the selected category. When the category changes, we need to query to get our products, since we only want products for our selected category. You'll recall that we're not loading our products data source when the form opens. So we're going to go ahead and add a rule to the category field. And we select new action. We're going to give it a name. We don't leave anything named rule one or rule two around this joint. And we're going to add an action. You see we've got this action now of change rest URL. That's because we've got rest data connections in our form. And the rest URL we are going to change is the one for products. Click FX because we are going to use a concat formula for this. So it's going to be concat. And I'm going to go ahead and put in my closing parenthesis now. And what I want to change is I want to change this one. Instead of having a one here, I want to use the category ID of the category that the user selected. So I'm closing my first string and I'm adding quotes to close my, my second string there. And I'm going to insert a field or group and it's going to be this category right here. So now I'll be passing in as my category the value that's been selected. I need to add a couple of commas here so that my concat statement is valid. Go ahead and just verify my formula. Okay, my formula is fine. I say OK. So now I've changed the REST web service URL and I don't want to forget to actually query for data. So we're going to query using our products data connection. Say OK. We'll preview the form to check it. We'll select a category and then we can see that our products are related to that category. Now if we change the category you'll see in our products we're now showing an ID and that's because the product that we previously selected is no longer available in the drop-down. Another thing worth noticing is the order of our items in the drop-down. They're, they're just in any old order. So let's go ahead and take care of both of those issues now. First, let's fix the ordering of the products. It's pretty simple to do. We've already talked about the order by system query operator. So we'll open up our action that changes our REST URL for our products and we'll simply add to the very end of our URI ampersand dollar sign order by equals product name. This will return our product names in alphabetical order. The other issue we were seeing was that when the category changed, we might still have an ID in the product field. We'll address that as well by clearing the product field whenever the category field changes. So we'll simply add an action to set a field's value. The field is going to be the product field and the value will be blank. Let's preview the form again. We'll select a category. As you can see, our list is now nicely sorted alphabetically. And when we change category, our product field is set to blank allowing us to choose a valid entry. So you can see rather quickly I've got a nicely functional set of cascading drop-downs. But mind you it's pretty unlikely you're going to want to build a form that uses Northwind, correct? But what about SharePoint? I'd mentioned we can use OData with SharePoint and I already have a view set up that does just that. In this instance what I've got here is I've got a status drop-down. Now this drop-down uses the tasks status list as the provider of its values. We have available all of the current possible task status values and if I select one it returns all of my tasks that are at that status as well as who it's assigned to. Let's take a quick look at the logic behind this. We'll navigate to that view. First the status field. The status field is a drop-down. 
it is using the tasks status. Now, the only reason I knew about that list was by using the list data service to return all of the entities available to me from SharePoint. I could tell because status was a drop down in my list itself. I could tell that it was getting its values from somewhere, and I made the assumption it was a list, whether I could easily find that list or not. And indeed, the list data service does expose this to me so that I'm able to leverage it. That way, I can make sure that my drop down in the form has exactly the status that are currently available to the tasks list in SharePoint so I can use it for selection. Then on this I have a rule to change the rest URL and what I'm doing is I'm adding a filter here to my tasks entity returning only things where the status value is equal to the status value that's been selected. Finally, I've also added a data source for users. Now this data source connects to the user information list entity. And you'll see down here in the properties that it returns and exposes all of this wonderful user information. So what I've done in this calculated value box is I've used a formula to get the name from the user list where the ID is equal to the assigned to ID from the task. That way instead of just showing the user ID number, I'm actually able to display the username for that task. Finally, in order to allow others to use our form, we need to publish it up to a form library. I'm going to publish my form up to Office 365. We go to File and Publish. Publish to a SharePoint library. This already has a library in there as I've published it once before. Select Next. I am going to leave this selected. You'll notice that that's selected by default to enable it to be filled out by a browser. And we are going to publish to a form library. I'm going to go ahead and create a new form library at this time. And I'm going to name mine. You can also enter a description here should you choose to. We can select our promoted properties at this point if we wish. And finally, we click Publish to go ahead and publish our form. You can see our location that we've published to is displayed. We've got an option to open the form library or to go ahead and simply open the form in the browser. At which point we can see that our form has opened correctly in the browser. So, in a matter of minutes, we created a new form, added connections to OData, used those connections for some controls, and added rule logic to get only the data we need exactly when we need it. We were even able to refine our form a bit and make it more user-friendly. Why pull back all your data when you can get just what you need? Keep your forms lean and mean. Get just the data you need, just when you need it. So that wraps up this demo. Be sure to check out all the great OData system query options, and you'll be amazed at what you can make InfoPath do. This is Hilary Stupa of QDAPR Software, and I would like to thank you for joining me today.